911, what's the nature of your emergency? She was already bad, not need one. On March 19, 2013, in DeSoto, Texas, 37-year-old Katina Murphy made a desperate call to 911 as her ex-husband, 40-year-old Andre, was breaking into her home. A few months prior, in October of 2012, Katina had filed for a restraining order after she claimed Andre was abusive during their marriage, which caused her to live in fear for herself and their 7-year-old daughter. She was granted temporary custody and moved in with her mother, where she was home alone at the time of the 911 call. One location emergency. Uh, 705, trail. please send somebody. Send somebody right now. I think my husband, my ex husband, is going to try to break it now. Send somebody, please. Okay, stay on the line with me. Are you home alone? Yes, I am alone. Mama, come okay. back home. Mama, come back home. Send somebody. Man, you talking to me is not going to slow anything down, okay? Stay on the line with me. Is, is he outside? Right, what's your Can you run out the back? Ma'am? I can't get to it now. Do you have a weapon, ma'am? Ma'am, do you have a... Run out of the back of the house, ma'am. I can't get to Police arrived just five minutes after the 911 call to find Katina and Andre's bodies upstairs in the master bedroom closet. Authorities believe Andre kicked in the front door and bolted up the stairs, then shot Katina while she hid in the closet and begged the dispatcher to send help. It was later discovered that the killing took place on the same day the former couple's divorce was finalized. Katina stated on her divorce filing in October of 2012 that Andre was not mentally stable and actions needed to be taken to protect her and her daughter. This was after an argument escalated at their former home, so she filed for the restraining order and custody of their daughter, both of which she received. DeSoto Police Captain Ron Smith said not only did two people die, but the incident was all the more painful because it made the couple's seven-year-old daughter an orphan. According to Jermaine Pearson, a cousin of Andre Murphy, the couple's daughter went to stay with other family members and will be fine, surrounded by the remaining family's love and support. Andre Murphy was an officer with Arlington Police from 2001 until he resigned in 2003. He also worked for Cedar Hill ISD Police from 2008 until 2012 when he was let go during a reorganization of the department. According to research published in the American Journal of Public Health, the presence of a gun in a domestic violence situation increases the risk of homicide by 500%. Including Katina, 119 women in Texas died at the hands of a current or former partner in 2013, which was more than the previous two years. To try to combat the increasing numbers, local leaders in Dallas County created a program they called Deadly Affection, where they examined all domestic violence deaths to understand how they could better prevent these tragic situations. However, the numbers continued to rise as in 2018, the state saw its highest number of domestic violence homicides in at least the last decade. The Texas Council on Family Violence reported 174 women, 211 individuals total, were killed by their intimate partners statewide. 
To help prevent further cases of domestic violence deaths, a pilot program known as Safe Surrender was created, where a person charged with a domestic violence incident has to temporarily surrender their firearms to the county until the case is resolved. The community hopes that an increase of housing options for survivors, targeting outreach to underserved communities, and expanding language services will also hopefully help to better handle and prevent domestic violence situations. Katina, who also went by Tina, had earned her doctorate in pharmacy and went on to work as a pharmacist in the Fort Worth area for 12 years. She was known as a warm, fun-loving person and a genuine friend who was taken too soon. She not only always had a smile on her face, but could always also put a smile on yours. Family and friends say she is deeply missed, but her light will shine on with the many memories they have to cherish, and she will remain in their hearts forever. On the morning of January 13, 2014, in West Palm Beach, Florida, 51-year-old Richard Berman made a call to 911 after receiving a threatening email from his ex-wife, 48-year-old Jennifer. Richard and Jennifer had recently gone through a divorce and were living separately while sharing equal time with their children, 16-year-old Alex and 15-year-old Jackie. Jennifer made an unsettling statement in the email that she was going to do the best thing for their family and do harm to the children, warning Richard that he should get to the house as soon as possible. After receiving the email, Richard raced over to the home they once shared, worried about what he'd find if he went inside, so he waited out front and made his call to 911. 911, where's your urgency? Answer from Dresser, give us the address. We're going to... I'm, I'm just about getting there, but it's kind of concerning me. My ex-wife said that she was going to harm the kids and that I should get over there SAP. Um, okay, how do you spell the name of the street? The house, but to be honest with you, I'm afraid to go in. Okay, how many, <laughs> um, how many kids are in the house? My two children and my ex-wife, but I don't know if they're there. I mean, but the car's in the driveway. It, are they and her I haven't been kids able to also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just recently got divorced. Was it a and, text or a... Well, she sent me an email that uh, uh, that she did the she did the best thing for our family, and uh, and then she sent my her cousin a text that she was going to kill the kids and 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 herself. And she's up in Port St. Lucie, and she's freaking out. She called me, and now I'm in front of the house, and then I should get here ASAP. All right. All right, just to let you know, I have the call in already, okay? Okay, I'm here. All right, just stay, stay on the line though, with me, though. Yeah. Okay, is she home? I, I, does she have a car I there? Have the, car, the, car, the car's in the driveway. Does she have any weapons in that house? Possibly. What do you mean? Do you know of any weapons? I, I remember there were. What kind? I'm sorry, I'm here with a neighbor. Okay, but I need this information from you. What kind, of, what kind of weapons have you seen in the house? Well, I remember she had her dad's old rifles. And this is her house? I, yeah, well, she, we just sold it recently and she's been renting it. I'm, I'm in the driveway and my neighbor just went in to, to, to look to see what's going on. How yeah. old are the kids? Uh, she's uh, 15 and 16. There's what? Yeah. What's going on? Oh, jeez. Okay, I'm on with 911. What's going on, there's, sir? There's, uh, it's up to you, sir. Sir, sir, speak to me. Yeah. What's going yeah. on? My neighbor went in, and there's blood up on the wall in, 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 in near her bedroom. Okay. Where are the kids? Hello, sir? Yeah. Okay, are the kids okay? I don't know. Yeah, get, somebody get me medics. We got, we're getting, we have police and paramedics on the way, sir. Her car's there. 
I'm afraid to go upstairs. Don't you need you need to stay outside. The officers want you to stay outside, sir. We need we need your neighbor outside too. We need everybody outside. Hey, sure. I so, can't talk right now. I I know I know I know. I need okay. you to be calm. Though. Did she say anything else? Did she say? Did she see your daughter? She said they're both upstairs in my in in. in, in she thinks they are. She thinks they are what? Upstairs in the bed. Yeah yeah. I'm sorry. So that that's okay. Can I speak to the neighbor? Hi. What did you? Hi, Oh, well, there's all this blood upstairs. The police are here right now, and I went up, and it, it, it looks like... I think the girl's up in bed with her, but once I got up, I saw what was up there. I had to run back downstairs, and he told me to come outside. The two police just went in the front door. All right, the police are there? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you, ma'am. Okay, do you want me to have the phone now? Yes, yes, you can hang up now. When investigators entered the home, they found a handwritten note on a glass table, one of the lines reading, quote, I'm so sorry to those that are hurting because they loved us, end quote. As they made their way throughout the home, investigators also noticed there were two empty bottles of wine on the kitchen counter. The first body found was 16-year-old Alex curled in a fetal position on his bed with a gunshot wound to the back of his head. Upstairs, they found Jennifer in her bed with a Winchester Model 94 rifle between her legs and resting on her chest with a bullet wound to the head. Next to her was her daughter Jackie, who was also curled in a fetal position with a bullet wound on the left side of her head. Investigators said it appeared that she had shot both of the children in the head while they slept before turning the gun on herself. The double murder-suicide came as a shock to the entire community, leaving everyone wondering what would drive a mother to commit such an act. Despite what friends and family knew Jennifer was going through at the time, they said they didn't see something like this ever happening. Jennifer and Richard first filed for divorce in 2008 after 16 years of marriage, but it was never finalized. Then the couple filed again in 2012, but again, they reconciled and continued living together for a short time. Then, in December of 2013, a month before the incident, the pair eventually decided to finalize the divorce and separate. Richard moved out while Jennifer and the kids continued to live in the home but were preparing to move out in February after the home had been sold. The family had lived lush for years as Richard's a prominent realtor in multi-million dollar homes, but after the divorce, Jennifer struggled to make ends meet. In May of 2013, court documents show that Jennifer filed for temporary alimony and child support, saying Richard had been refusing to purchase things like toilet paper and groceries. Documents also show that Jennifer had asked the judge to kick Richard out of the house, claiming there was extreme emotional abuse. Despite his job, Richard was also struggling with money due to the housing crash, listing his monthly expenses on divorce papers at $4,700, but an income of $2,888. A friend of his stated that Richard was being painted as a terrible father who did not care about his children, which his friend said was far from the truth. Court records show he laid no claim to the family's home, paid for the lease on his wife's car, and paid $600 a month in child support. Still, Jennifer was working 12-hour overnight shifts as a nurse for an elderly man and even had to sell her late father's watch just to try to make ends meet. This, while also dealing with the divorce, moving, and the death of her mother a few months earlier, had quickly overwhelmed the mother of two. Her family says they do not believe Jennifer committed the act out of revenge, but that she honestly thought she was doing the right thing for her and the children. 16-year-old Alex and 15-year-old Jackie were both extremely talented musicians who attended the prestigious Dreyfus School of the Arts, where Alex played cello and Jackie violin. Their father often looks back on the videos he took of them playing, cherishing the time he spent with them traveling to their musical events.
He visits Dreyfus often and volunteers his time helping at concerts, something that he believes helps him to cope. He said he's donated his children's instruments to other students so their legacy will live on and to help the other kids who have so much talent and opportunity to move forward. On February 8, 2019, in Bridgeton, New Jersey, 24-year-old Nakira Griner called 911 saying that she had just been attacked by a stranger and that her two-year-old son, Daniel, was abducted. The 911 dispatcher initially struggled to understand what she was saying as she was sobbing throughout the call. Nakira claimed she was attacked on Atlantic Street while walking to Walgreens with her son in a stroller and her younger son strapped to her chest. She said her assailant kicked her and she fell to the ground as the attacker continued to kick her in the head and right side, and when she was finally able to look up, the stroller, along with Daniel, was gone. 911, where's emergency? What? Hello? Hello? Can you tell me where you're at? Hello? Can you hear me? Hi, this is 911. What's going on there? What's the address? Are you at a house? Are you in the street? What? You're hiding? Okay. Are you in a house or are you on the street? You're on the street. All right. Are you at a, are you at a corner, like an intersection? Okay. All right. Don't move where you're at. Okay. Who are you hiding from? All right. What's your name? I need you to uh, listen. Listen, ma'am. Ma'am, I need you to try to slow down. Okay. What is your name? Okay, listen, I, I'm really trying to understand you, but it's really difficult while you're crying. Try to take a deep breath, slow your breathing down, and tell me what's going on so I can help you. Do you know where you're at at all? What? You're walking to the store? What's the name of the store? Walgreens? And what happened to you? Alright, listen, don't hang up the phone, okay? I'm going to get the police on the phone. Don't hang up. Bridgeton Police. It's County. I have a female on the line. It was originally a 911 hang up. I called it back, and it's a female that's crying. Said that she's hiding. Her GPS put her at South Giles and New Street uh, near that intersection there. Uh, Ma'am, are you still on the line? It sounds like she disconnected again. She is having some sort of emergency, but I can't understand what she was saying. Through the crying. She said something about her baby and that she was walking towards Walgreens when it happened. All right, I'm um, right. out there. Thank you so much. All right, bye. Bye. All right, where do you know where you're at right now? Can you describe what you see around you? I was running. I was running. Who are you running from? Someone put right here. All right, where are you right now? What do you see around you? Do you see a house number? I'm in the bushes. You're in where? I'm in the bushes. The bushes of where? Are you, are you on Giles Street, do you know? I'm going to call 911 back so I can get a better location on you. Alright, do me a favor, call 911 right back. 911, where's emergency? Alright, the phone, okay. Are you injured? Do you need an ambulance? Were you jumped? I think you pushed me on the ground. All right. Is your child injured too, or no? Be alone in my baby. He's crying. Okay. Your baby's injured as well. I fell on top of him. You fell on top of him. How old is he? I'm How old is he? Over here. I'm 
Do you see the police? Yes. Okay, we're going to start an ambulance over there as well, okay? And how old is your son? Eight months. Is he conscious? Okay, and you fell on his head, ma'am? Police responded to the area around 6.30 p.m. and came upon Nakira, where she then started to explain the attack and how her son was taken. Based on the abduction claim, police launched a multi-agency search for the missing child using bloodhounds to track his scent. They later found the stroller a few blocks from Atlantic Street containing only a pair of red sneakers. As police were interviewing Nakira, she could not give a description of her attacker, and her story began to change, including switching the location where the assault occurred. When police obtained surveillance camera footage, no video could be found to support her claims, and police also noticed that she showed no physical signs of being assaulted. When Nakira was asked to take a polygraph test, she initially declined. However, after speaking with her husband, she agreed to take the test, but subsequently failed it. Then, about nine hours after Daniel was reported missing, the case turned from an abduction to a homicide investigation. While police were searching the Griner home, they discovered burnt human remains in trash bags buried under the shed in the backyard. Court records state when police arrived at the home, they found windows open, fans running, and an officer noticed a burning odor. The report also states that police found a large pink handbag that contained dismembered and burned remains of a child. The purse also showed an apparent shoe print consistent with Ugg boots, which Nakira was wearing, and she also had dirt on the knees of her pants. The remains were positively identified as Daniel's, which left neighbors, family, and friends in total shock. The same day as the remains were found, Nakira Griner was arrested and charged with first-degree murder, second-degree endangering the welfare of a child, second-degree desecration of human remains, and fourth-degree tampering with evidence. During interviews with police, Nakira eventually admitted to striking Daniel because he would not eat his breakfast nor listen to her. She said she hit him so hard that it left bruises on his face, then she also stated that her son fell down a flight of stairs, which further added to his injuries. An autopsy determined Daniel died of blunt force trauma and that he suffered multiple bone fractures. Nakira entered a plea of not guilty as her public defender, Kimberly Schultz, described the child's death as an accident and has stated that her client previously sought help for mental health issues and she was suffering from postpartum psychosis at the time of Daniel's death. After a mental evaluation, a judge found Nakira competent to stand trial, but her lawyer is seeking to have prosecutors barred from using her initial statements to police in court. They claim she was not notified during questioning that she was considered a suspect in the case and should have been immediately advised of her rights. She also argues that Nakira was going through a mental break and was in no position to voluntarily waive her rights. A month after her arrest, Nakira's attorney filed a motion claiming Daniel Griner Sr., Nakira's husband, admitted to prosecutors that he had struck the child with a belt on at least four occasions in the days prior to his death. Schultz believes prosecutors acted too soon in arresting Nakira without fully investigating all parties involved. She says because of his admission, Daniel Sr. should have also been considered a suspect However, Assistant Prosecutor Elizabeth Vogelsong stated the investigation does not show that the child's father was in any way connected to the homicide, and he has never been charged. A small memorial was set outside of the home of 23-month-old Daniel Greiner, where devastated family members, friends, and neighbors left mementos to remember the two-year-old. Daniel's obituary states, quote, he was an enthusiastic and happy kid, always running around with a big smile on his face. He is loved very much by all of his family. 
Daniel loved playing with toys, chasing mom and dad around the house, eating Cheetos, and watching Shrek. He was full of life and full of love. A parent could not have asked for a better son. Daniel will be deeply missed by all of those who loved him, end quote. Nakira Griner was initially in the Cumberland County Jail, but has since been moved to Cape May County Jail as her trial continues. On the morning of April 12, 2018, in Nightdale, North Carolina, a mother called 911 reporting that her son, 42-year-old Stephen Platel, called and confessed to her that he killed his 7-month-old baby. Stephen told his mother not to go over to his home, so she called 911 asking police if they could perform a welfare check. His mother explained to the dispatcher that Stephen was upset after his wife called him the day before and told him she wanted nothing to do with him anymore. When authorities finally arrived at Stephen's home, they found his son suffocated and left alone in a bathroom closet, but the horror wouldn't stop there as this would only be the first of four people to be found dead on that day. Not only did Stephen confess to killing his baby, but after doing so, he drove to his wife's home 500 miles away, then shot and killed her and her adoptive father. Address for the emergency. Yes, um, uh, my son just called me, and uh, he told me he, oh my God, uh, he killed his his baby. And he's in the house. Okay, you said that he told you he killed his baby. Oh my God. Okay, ma'am, listen to me. What's your name? Oh okay, tell me exactly what happened. Uh, he, uh, he's, he's not home. His wife broke up with him over the phone yesterday, and he told me. She's in New York, and he told me he was on his way. He called me last night and said he's on his way. He's going to bring the baby to her, and then he was coming back. And he just, he just, okay. he said he doesn't have, he killed his wife. He killed her father, and he, I can't even believe this is okay. happening. And did this happen in Nightdale? Uh, no, the, 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 his wife and father are in New York. Okay, and, so the incident but, but actually... He left, he left the baby dead when he left. Okay, where did, where did he leave the baby? Okay, he said it was in the... <laughs> What's your son's name? <laughs> What's his last name? Same as mine. When did oh, this happen? He, he said he left last night. He called me, I forget, maybe about seven last night and said he was on his way to New York. He was going to bring to his wife and give it to her. And then he'd be back. And, and he called me this morning. I, I just got up the phone just a couple of minutes ago. And he told and I... Oh, God. He told me to call the police that I shouldn't go over there. Okay, so the son is, uh, so your son is not there? No, no, the house is empty. The, oh, he said he put a key under the front mat. To take a key to get into the house under the front mat. Did he say how oh, he my. did it? Or what no, he did? No, and I, I didn't ask him. I didn't ask him. I didn't want to know. Oh, my God. It's such a wonderful little... Okay, hold, hold on just a second, okay? <laughs> okay. Hello? Okay, I'm still here. What I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to go ahead and get you over to Raleigh Communications, okay? Let me talk first when I call, okay, so I can kind of give them an idea of what was going on, and then I'm going to let you speak with a telecommunicator, okay? Nice. All right, hold on for me, okay? Okay. Are you still with me? I'm here. Hey, this 
Over in Cary, I have a lady wanting to report a possible homicide. At All right. And she states that she got a call from her son. Was it this morning? Yes. Uh, this morning, stating that her his wife had split up with him, and she was in New York, and that he uh, killed their left him upstairs at the residence. Moment, okay. <laughs> so I'm still here, okay? <laughs> okay. Okay. Do you know if he's still at home? No, he's not. He's not. Okay. Okay, Riley, I'm gonna disconnect. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Uh huh. <sighs> After killing his son, wife, and her adoptive father. Stephen turned the gun on himself in Dover, New York, his body being found in his van and later connected to the triple homicide. Although this seemed like another strained relationship that resulted in three horrible murders, there was a lot more to Stephen and Katie's marriage, as Katie was not only his wife, but also his daughter. To unravel the twisted tale, we can begin back when Katie's biological parents, Stephen and his now ex-wife Alyssa, met in 1995 when he was 20 and Alyssa 15, where they then had Katie in 1998. However, they decided to put Katie up for adoption as they felt they were too young and not financially stable enough to raise a child. At eight months old, Katie was adopted and moved to New York to live with Anthony and Kelly Fusco, where she was raised for the next 17 years. Then in early 2016, now 18 years old, Katie grew curious about her biological family, so she began messaging with her biological parents, Alyssa, now 37, and Stephen, now 42, who had since had two other daughters. Then in August of 2016, Katie decided instead of following her plans to enroll in college, she would move to Henrico, Virginia to reunite and live with her biological parents. By that time, Alyssa and Stephen had begun sleeping in separate beds as Alyssa claimed they had been having marital problems after suffering years of emotional and verbal abuse by her husband. Around six weeks after Katie moved into the home, Stephen began sleeping on the floor in her bedroom, which immediately concerned Alyssa, so after he did it again the next night, she confronted him, but he told her it was none of her business and stormed out of the house. Soon after that, and unbeknownst to Alyssa, Stephen and Katie began their sexual relationship. Around the same time, Alyssa finally filed for divorce from Stephen and moved out of the home, agreeing to share equal custody of their two other daughters. Alyssa would not find out the extent of Stephen and Katie's relationship until five months later in May of 2017 when she learned Katie was pregnant with Stephen's baby. She promptly called and reported them to the police, where Henrico County police officers interviewed Stephen and Alyssa's two other children, but no arrests were made at that point. Then in June of 2017, in the midst of a police investigation, Katie and Stephen moved to Nightdale, North Carolina and got married, lying when filling out their application, saying they were not related, which allowed them to be married legally. The wedding was complete with guests, including both Stephen's parents and Katie's adoptive parents, who reportedly said there was, quote, nothing they could do except support Katie, end quote. In September, three months after their wedding, the couple had their baby, but the happiness soon turned to hardship when in January of 2018, Stephen and Katie were finally arrested and charged with incest and adultery. They were later released on bond in order to have no contact, so Katie moved back to New York with her adoptive parents, and Stephen's mother gained custody of their son. Then, in April of 2018, Katie decided to finally end her relationship with Stephen, and despite the no-contact order, she called him to break up with him. 
On April 11th, Stephen, upset and frustrated, drove to his mom's house and picked up his baby, telling his mother he and the baby were going to Skype with Katie that evening. However, shortly before midnight, and despite knowing this would violate the terms of his bond, Stephen told his mother he was now taking the baby to see Katie. Instead, he brought the baby back to his house, where he later suffocated him and left his body in the closet. Then Stephen drove over 500 miles throughout the night to Katie's home in New York and waited outside until he saw her leave in a car with her adoptive father heading to her grandmother's house about an hour away. Stephen followed the pair and at one point while stopped at a stop sign, he pulled his van next to Katie's father's truck, then shot and killed both her and her adoptive father. After that is when he called his mother to confess what he had done before driving to Dover, New York and turning the gun on himself, resulting in a triple murder-suicide that spanned across three states. The relationship between Stephen and Katie can be attributed to the term called genetic sexual attraction, which can occur when a person has been separated from a biological family member from a young age and upon meeting them again, becomes sexually attracted to them. According to psychologists, the theory is that, quote, close relatives due to similar genetic makeup may be genetically predisposed towards the same interests and have a highly compatible personality. This makes relatives who meet later in life more likely to find each other attractive than would two random people, end quote. Twenty-year-old Katie loved all animals but had a special fondness for rescuing stray cats. She was an aspiring artist known at her high school for drawing comic strips and was a self-employed freelance artist. She planned to attend college and use her talents and passions to pursue a career in digital advertising, but her life was taken before she could spread her creativity with the world. Her family is deeply hurt by the unexpected and tragic losses, still trying to find ways to cope after Stephen's actions shattered the lives of so many. On April 16, 2011, in Oak Harbor, Ohio, 31-year-old Alan Atwater made a quick call to 911 and reported that a terrible accident had just taken place at his home. He sounded calm and vaguely explained to the dispatcher what occurred, then suddenly ended the call. Not knowing if there was going to be a hostage situation due to the information Alan disclosed, a special response team was sent to the home, arriving minutes after the 911 call, which took place at 12.11 a.m. Otto County 911. Yes, this is Alan Atwater. I'm in 964 Lights Road. Okay. Um, there's been a terrible accident at my house. Um, my wife and three children are dead. Okay, what happened? Um, Gunshot wound. Okay. And I'm getting ready to kill myself right now. Okay, did you kill them? Yes. Okay, what 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 went on? While the special response team was stationed outside of the home, they tried contacting Alan using a loudspeaker and also tried calling his cell phone but they never got a response. Then at 2.52 a.m., almost three hours after the 911 call, they finally forced the front door open, at which time Alan's body and the bodies of his wife and three children were discovered. In an upstairs bedroom, they found Alan and his wife, 30-year-old Dawn, and their three children, 4-year-old Ashley, 2-year-old Isaac, and 1-year-old Brady. The parents and two older children were on the floor while the youngest was in a bed, each with a single gunshot wound. Alan's grandmother, Joan Atwater, who lived next door to the family, was up late when she heard a report about the 911 call on a police scanner. 
She immediately recognized the address and tried calling the family 20 to 30 times, then even went to the home hoping it was a mistake, but she later found out what happened and was devastated. Authorities described the deaths as an unexplainable incident, noting at first that there were no known prior domestic or financial problems with Allen or the family. However, one of Allen's relatives told authorities that in the days leading up to the shooting, Allen mentioned to her that the couple was having marital problems and he would do anything to keep them together. When authorities looked into it further, they found out that two days before the shootings, Dawn told a friend she was no longer willing to give Alan a chance after he had several in the past and that she no longer had feelings for him. Then on the day of the shooting, Alan confided in a friend that he had recently returned home from a seven-week business trip when Dawn told him she wanted a separation. Dawn endured years of emotional and verbal abuse during their marriage, which was filled with threats and infidelity, and had reportedly been wanting to leave for at least a year before the murders. Another of Dawn's friends also told investigators that Alan and his wife both acknowledged that he had pushed her against a wall and choked her early in their marriage. Despite these issues, Alan's family always thought the marital troubles were minor and they never imagined he would ever turn the gun on himself and his beautiful family. Sheriff's Captain Olin Martin said the deaths were a tragedy that shocked and saddened the community and Sheriff Bratton added that the case took an emotional toll on all the officers involved, leaving everyone unable to make sense of it all. Dawn was quiet, but known as a great cook and a good friend, and truly loved being a stay-at-home mom, taking care of Ashley, Isaac, and Brady, all of who will be forever missed by family and friends. Hey guys, thanks for watching the video and making it this far. I just wanted to take a minute at the end here to ask y'all to check out the description box to learn more about domestic violence. I'm going to link some helpful articles as well as the National Domestic Violence website where you could find tips, resources, or to chat online if you ever need help or want to learn more helpful information. The life for a domestic abuse victim can be lonely, isolating, and filled with fear, so sometimes reaching out and letting them know that they have support can provide a huge relief. So if you have a second, check out those links to learn more about warning signs and red flags of an abusive relationship, and ways to help yourself or someone you know who may be dealing with these issues. And as always, thanks for watching.